I will do an executive summary of the lesson as we move along. It's already 10 minutes to 10. Ideally, we would have begun 20 minutes ago. As all of us are aware, we are looking at the first quarter of the year of the Lord, 2023. And this is the first lesson for this quarter. And the whole of this quarter, we are going to remind ourselves of who we are, what we have, and what is our responsibility. We are going to remind ourselves about who gave us what we have and what does he expect of us. So this quarter we are going to basically talk about stewardship. That as Christians, when we read Genesis 1, we are told God created everything. God is the creator. God has created everything from day one to day six, including you and me. So we are God's property. But whatever God created on the sixth day was special and was given a special responsibility. Adam and Eve, who were created on the sixth day, they were not just created and left there. Like the sun was created, the moon was created, the vegetation was created, the sea was created, the skies were created. When Adam and Eve were created, they were given responsibility. And that responsibility is the title of the quarterly this quarter. They were given the responsibility of being managers. When you are a manager, the property does not belong to you. The property you manage, if you gave me an apartment complex to manage, the apartment complex does not belong to me. It belongs to the owner. But the owner has given me responsibility to take care of that property. One thing for somebody to make you a manager, that person must trust you. You, can, you are not going to give somebody your property to manage if you don't trust them. Two, when somebody gives you a management role, he knows you are able to do it. He does not only trust that you can do it, but he knows that you are able to do it. So this quarter, we are talking about managing for the master. And this management role is not a forever role. That's why there are writings at the bottom of that quarterly heading. Managing for the master, not forever. Until he does what? Until he comes. So we are going to look at managing what God has given us. And God has given us everything. Don't think about managing just resources. Even managing your own life. Your own body. Because the Bible says, don't you know that your bodies are what? The temple. So it means management is a total sum of everything. Yourself, your body, your life, the resources God has given you. He also expects you to manage them. So we are going to talk about managing for the master. So the whole of this quarter, we are going to talk about the God we have. Just imagine somebody creates the world without involving you. But at the end of the creation, he says, now I step aside and leave my creation to manage the world I've created. What does that one tell you about the God? What does that one tell you about the master? 
what kind of relationship does it show the master wants us to have with him? Because he has created everything and yet he has surrendered responsibility of management to one of his creation. That means that the creator, the master, has a very strong, trusting, and loving relationship. If he didn't love us, if he didn't trust us, he would not give us responsibility to manage. And then we are also expected to reciprocate. Because if I show you trust, I expect you to reciprocate, to respond back in the same manner. That is why one of, of the key texts we are going to talk about is what manner of love. It is a love that transcends human understanding. That is why even the writer says, what manner of love? It is it's not a love that human beings can describe. Sometimes it is the way God loves us, we cannot be able to describe. That he loved us so much that even when we sin, we are supposed to die, he decides that his only begotten son should die on our behalf. So we are going to look at how, at the end of the day, what is our responsibility as managers? We are going to say that God expects us to honor him through our resources, through our possessions. We are expected to honor God through the resources he has given us, whether it is life, whether it is property, whether it is time. Stewardship is about managing everything. How do you do it to honor God? How do you do it to glorify God? And how do you do it to promote the kingdom of God? That's what we are going to look at. God, perhaps, you know, sometimes we, we try to look for resources so hard until at one point we say, we own. I own this, I own this house, I own this. Most times that's what we say, isn't it? I own two cars. That's what we talk about here. I own a house. I own this. But the lesson is telling us God is the one with the resources. God is the owner. Until we get that deep in our hearts, we will be falling short. We need to understand God is the owner of all our resources. And we should work with him. So we are expected to be partners. Use our resources to work with God, to prosper his kingdom. Because he says, God allows us to handle them for him. Everything God has given you, whether they are children, whether they are resources, whatever manner, including your own life. Because some people live for 20 years, others live for 40, others live for 50. It means God has given you a resource known as life, that you, you, you live up to 70. There's another one, God didn't allow him to do what? To live up to 70. Somebody lived, do you know even Jesus lived on it at three years? Because God could have decided, let Jesus missionary, mission work go on for 100 years, 100 years before he goes back to heaven. So what am I saying? Even the time is a resource a resource we need to manage. So, our key text is taken from 1 John 3 verse 1. 1 John 3 verse 1, which says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. So the first lesson we are talking about, part of God's family. We are part of God's family. That is why God has given us the title, you are my what? My children. Those people you address as children, they are part of your family. God has not called us his relatives. Have you ever seen anywhere God says you are my relatives? 
Uh, God has never said you are my neighbors. God says you are what? My children. And even in the Lord's prayer, what does God teach us? How do we pray? Our Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. That shows that we are part and parcel of God's family. So when God has given us management of his property, he knows that those people managing my property are part of my family. Let's say it in a fact. For example, all of us who stay in Kenya, if I have a house in, in Kenya, for example, and I'm here, if I have a property in Kenya and I want somebody to manage them for me, do I look for a neighbor or I look for a, somebody who is close to me, part of my family member? Who do you think is easier? And, until they frustrate you. Forget about They can frustrate you. But be, before your family member frustrates, the first person is, my brother is the one who does something. My sister is taking care of my uncle. You know? First of all, the first person we give responsibility to manage our resources is a member of our what? Our family. That God has bestowed us to be called his children. And if we are God's children, then everything our father has belongs to who? To us. Because if God is our father, and everything on earth belongs to our father, and we are the children of our father, what does it mean? Everything belongs to the family. So when we use it, we use it for the benefit of the whole family. That is why God wants us to understand that part of the relationship. That God created a perfect family. Forget about when sin comes in. Adam was created and Eve. And before sin comes in the third chapter of Genesis, Adam had already been given what? Stewardship. When Adam was created, what was he told? Name every, every creation. God gave that responsibility. Give everything their names. And he, he was told that I have given you everything. This garden of Eden, I have given you to manage. What was he told? I have given you the garden of Eden to do what? To manage. Basically, he was given the responsibility. Manage this, and this will be your food, all those things. He was given management. He was told that I have given you this earth for you to be the steward, to be in control, to manage it, to subdue it. So even before coming of sin, Adam was a manager because he was part of God's family. So when we go and then we look at all those resources and all the needs we have, the thing the writer wants us to understand this quarter is that the resources we have, we need to use them first to benefit us. That is a fact. You are not going, for example, to earn all your money and donate it. Because God says, love thy neighbor as thy who? Thyself. It means you must love yourself first. First, God's resources should be used on you. Then it goes to your neighbor, and then it goes to promote God's work. By the way, those are the three responsibilities of the resources God has given you. To use them, because what was Adam given? The Garden of Eden, and he was told, use everything for food. For food. So it is about God's resources for you. Then God's resources for who? Your neighbor, love thy neighbor as thyself. You cannot give love unless you have it. You can't love your neighbor unless you love yourself. That's what the Bible says, basically. And three, God expects us to use the resources he has given us to promote his kingdom. To do God's work, God's work. So God has not allowed us to accumulate resources for selfish purposes. Every resource God has accumulated, he has, give, you know, he has given you resources so that for you, for your neighbor, and to promote God's kingdom. So, I will give two people to make comments on the introduction. Anybody, you can raise. Yes, yes Ken. <clears throat> Yes, my contribution on this uh, topic is that uh, the reason why you are sitting here 
is to understand that what we have, we're supposed to be stewardship. Those things, we may say, yes, what, what God has given us, how us to use, but if we need to go back at the garden of Eden, what happened there? Adam and Eve were told now, be in charge of this one. So the first beginning, we should start from that. We should know whatever you're going through, to understand that what we have in this world, God has given us on how to do what, to take care of them. And taking care of them is not for our personal use only, unless we touch others with what has, what has placed them. Another thing I can comment is this one. Because the memory sex said, behold, that what the man of love, the father, has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. How do we become children of God? We have to have a relationship with him to know what love is so they can be able to do what to touch us, others. So this being the children of God is having a relationship with him so that what we have, we can use on others as Job did. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else would like to comment on the introduction? Yes, Elder. I, I just want to say something small here. Um, it is very easy uh, as we look for money. This money denies us the heavenly kingdom. Because the lesson has come uh, at the right time to, to let us know that God has given uh, instructions or directions on how we need to look for the money. And once we got the money, and how we need to use it. So it doesn't want us to forget that it is it's also good for us to be rich. Mm -hmm. But he warns that those who look for richness, mm -hmm. they need to be careful, otherwise they may go into destruction. Mm -hmm. But we remember, in the Bible, there are people who are very rich. Abraham mm -hmm. was very, very rich. rich. Job was very rich. Mm -hmm. But they, they used their wealth very well because they knew everything came from God. Mm -hmm. The danger is that once we get rich, we forget. We forget. And think that everything is ours. Mm -hmm. We have worked for it. You know, sometimes we talk about that. Mm -hmm. You know, I've worked. You know how many hours I've yeah, I put in. <laughs> you know how many doubles <laughs> I did to uh -huh. get this money. Yeah. So that is the problem. Uh -huh. Because once we, <laughs> we embrace that thinking that we are the ones who have worked so hard, mm -hmm. then we forget about God. And uh, that is the danger on which uh, the lesson is going to let us more understand. But by the way, into the lesson, maybe we will get it, that everything, even if we work so hard, everything mm -hmm. is God. Yeah. Because if God didn't wake us up, imagine, will you get the money? No. We, we always say, thank you, God, for waking me up today. But, but when you get the money, it becomes ours. We forget that it is God who gave us, so we should freely mm -hmm. give. Yeah. The last thing I want to talk about is how do we become God's children? Mm -hmm. You know, the when Adam and Eve were created, they were God's children. Mm -hmm. But after sin, mm -hmm. whose children did they become? The devil's. The devil's children. Mm -hmm. So th there was a way, again, they had to come back. And that's why Jesus dies for our sins. And I want us to read this first so that I stop. It is a John, first John. First John, um, first John 5. I think it's first John 5. Uh, 5 and then verse 1. It reads, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves mm -hmm. him who be God also loves him who is begotten of him. So, so the secret or the, 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 the chance of us becoming children of God or the part of the family of God is loving Christ. And once we love Christ, we also love the one who begot Christ. And then we become begotten of him. There is no secret. Not coming to church. Coming to church is good, mm -hmm. but all of us have to be born of God. And uh, again, the lesson, when I was reading the commentary, is being baptized is, is good. Mm -hmm. It's public declaration that I love God. Mm -hmm. But do our works 
to our life change. You know, we have to be born of the Spirit. That is the emphasis here. Those who are born of the Spirit of God are the ones who are children of God. Thank you. So, already, elders talked partly of what we were looking at at Sunday. That we were children of God in chapter 1 and chapter 2 of Genesis. But in chapter 3 of Genesis, that relationship has been severed. That relationship has been broken by the coming of what? Sin. That when sin came, that relationship of father and children has been broken. Remember before sin, God used to visit Adam and Eve once a month or once a week. Every evening, God used to come and see, check on them. How was your day? Catch on their welfare. Because he was a father to them. But with the coming of sin, that relationship is severed. There comes a separation. And for the restoration of that relationship, we need God the Son. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish. Jesus comes to restore that relationship and Jesus himself. How does Jesus, when he dies on the cross, he teaches the apostles how to pray. He tells them, now that I'm here, I am Emmanuel. I have come to restore the relationship. Now I was sent by who? My father who art in he heaven. Now you are also by faith, you are my bro brothers. And if you are my brothers and God is my father, so what does that one mean? You are, he's also your father. Your father. We are on Sunday, and I believe you know those verses. I'm paraphrasing Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. In this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Our Father in heaven. It's not your father. Jesus that does not say pray that my father in heaven. By faith. The father of our savior Jesus is also our father. And Jesus went ahead to say that if God is my father and God is also your father, then I am your what? Your brother. He says there, I am your brother. He is our brother and we are all brothers and sisters. That's why we talk about brethren. Even when we meet, for, let's, let's just bring it here where we are. Even if I took you from the US and I took you to China and you saw an Adventist church, when you go in there, how would you stand up and greet those people? You know nobody. How would you greet them? Brothers and why? Because by faith, because all of us have the same faith in Christ. We ought to become brothers and sisters. Even if you went to a very strange place you have never gone. Usually the first question you ask is, do you have an Advent in church around? What are you looking for? You are looking for your brothers and sisters. You know that when I land in an Advent in church, I am among my brothers and my sisters. That is God's family. It is a family founded on faith. It is a family founded on the salvation we get through God the Son. The family of God did not start on earth. If our God is in heaven, so we talk about, the writer is talking about the family of heaven and the family of earth have been united. They are what? They are one. And who made that union possible? 
Christ. It is Christ who came from heaven. Sin has separated the heavenly family from the earthly family. Now, Emmanuel. Jesus was called Emmanuel, which means God with us. He has come to reunite, to restore the relationship between the heavenly and the earthly family have become one. By faith, we have become one. Anybody with a comment on Sunday? We are part of God's family. Okay, Elder, you can go ahead. Thank you so much, Elder. What I can comment is about union of Christ and with one or another. How does the devil see us as sometimes? Or as adulterers? There is something which I, when I was going through the lesson that it struck me more because of the comments which Ellen T. White put on the upward on the upward look book on page 358. There's something which he said it struck me so much. He says how does the devil see us in the, in the church? Because they have this called out in there. When the devil looks at us in the church, the book wants us this way. Let us be careful that the devil could not say, look at them the way they are fighting. Look at the way they are fighting and they are Christians. They call themselves the sons of Christ. Instead, they are wasting time fighting each other instead of fighting against me. That's the devil saying there. So this union with Christ and the union with others, that's the relationship. Let's be careful when, they, when we are in the church. What are we doing? Because Christ and God, they are one. We as Christians in the church, what are we doing? So if you are getting a warning here, say that let's not give the devil a chance to see, look what they are doing there. They are fighting the church instead of doing what? Fighting against me. That's the devil, the devil says. That's my comment. Thank you. So God is the owner of everything. That is Monday. Yes. You know, sometimes we, some statements are so deep that we tend to take them so short. God is the owner of everything. God created for five days, he created nature. He created the environment. And every day at the end of the day, God looked at the creation for the first day. He put a mark. It was Remember, what did he used to say at the end of the every day? Okay. It was good. Second day, it was good. Third day, it was good. Fifth day, it was good. But on the sixth day, when he created man, he said it was very good. God's work is perfect. God created a perfect world for us to stay. It is a sin that caused the trouble. So, what does that one tell us about God? God did not aspire that he creates us to suffer. He did not create an environment which was supposed to give us problems. But God has also given us stewardship of nature. All our responsibility is on the creation of the sixth day. God has given us responsibility to take care of nature. It is for us to take care of the environment. Why do animals don't take care of the environment? It is for us to take care of the environment, whether we decide to pollute the environment, whether we decide to cut all the trees, we get the certification. In simple terms, what we are saying, God created a perfect world. When we understand that everything belongs to God, we will treat everything like the owner would wish it to be treated. We'll take care of the environment. We'll take care of the trees. We'll take care of everything that God has given us. By the way, do you know everything that was created from day one to day five 
was meant to prepare for you to live in comfort. Have you ever thought that what if God created human beings on the first day? Wangeka wapi? Wangekunya majigani? Where would have, have you ever thought about it? What if we were the first creation? God made sure that everything was ready for who? Man. That's where at the end, Adam and Eve are given what? Responsibility to take care of God's creation. We are managers. So when the environment is deteriorating, who is to blame? The manager. When we have the earth is being polluted, who is to blame? The manager. When we have children going, going wayward, who do we blame? The manager. God has given you children. You are the steward. The steward. The Bible says the children are God's, but you are only the earthly parents. You are parenting on behalf of who? God. That's where God tells you, train a child. You, it's not a human being who said that, by the way. Train a child on the way to grow. That is God telling you that the responsibility. By the way, the Bible says that's the only question you'll be asked in heaven. Where are the children I gave you? You are a manager. So everything belongs to God. You know, the problem, when we lose that idea that everything belongs to God, then we become selfish. That is the source of selfishness. It is mine. It belongs to me. So what do we do? Because I, everything belongs to me, I want to be corrupt, I want to grab, I want to amass everything to me. Because it is about me. It is no longer about God. God. When everything becomes about me, you, then we have selfishness. We cannot even, you, we cannot even you say, okay, I need to save this. I don't want to give tide this month. I want to finish my house at home. It is about who? Me. We have forgotten the owner who has said, return. 10%. Return the first fruits. That's what Israel was told. Whenever they harvest, where did they take the first fruits? They were supposed to go to the temple. But when we forget who is the true owner, then we end up on the side of selfishness. We are unable to realize. And when we become selfish, then we, we are blinded from the love of God. Because God has given us everything, and every creation is supposed to be a testimony about God's love. But when you are using God's property as a testimony about yourself, then you are forgetting who is the creator. So you say, you see, I have this. I've worked very hard. I'm very intelligent. I've gone to school. I've invested. Who are you celebrating when you are making those statements? Are you celebrating God or you are celebrating yourself? That is the danger that God wants to talk about. Any comments on God is the owner of everything? I just want to bring a story of David here. Um, David is one person who lived very well in the Bible. He was a very good friend of God. And he realized uh, in his life that everything he had any success he had came from God. And that's why we read a lot about how David was full of songs. He praised God for whatever he did for him. So David, after he had won all the wars, he requested one thing from God, that he should build a temple, a temple for God. Through the prophet Nathan, he went to God to ask for that request so that he can do that. But God said, no, uh, man of war. tell David, he was a man of war. He can't build a house for me, but his son will do it for me. And then David didn't stop there. He asked God, can I have the privilege of collecting the resources necessary for building your house and even doing the plan? God said, okay, okay go, ahead. go ahead. So David, um, that's why I'm now reading from... Uh, 
First Chronicles chapter 29. That's where I am. He said, um, he called people, he, he told them what the plan was. And everybody went ahead, they collected a lot. All gold, all silver, all bronze. They went to the forest, they got the, 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 the best timber, the best stones. And when everything was done, they wanted to, to come together and thank God. I liked the way uh, verse 11, that's First Chronicles 29, verse 11 to 16. And I'm just reading the very fast. It says, everything in heaven and earth is yours. That is the confirmation of David in verse 11. Verse 12, it says, wealth and honor come from you. And 14, everything comes from you. Verse 14, it says, still says, we have given you only what comes from your hand. All this abundance comes from your hand. All of this belongs to you. So what is David saying? Mm -hmm. It is indeed mm -hmm. us people who have brought everything. Mm -hmm. But we brought to you what belongs to you. Mm -hmm. Do we have anything to call ours? No. So that, that's the question he ends up asking. Mm -hmm. So God, you are good. Mm -hmm. So in, in this case, I just want us also to understand in this lesson as we start that everything we have Everything we, we, we get, it is through God's providence. And God has given to us. So when he asks for it, we shouldn't feel painful to give it. We should really be thankful and also praise God that he has also seen it well, that we should also participate in, in the mission he has given us. In fact, it's an honor. And that's why David was said, can I have the honor of building you a temple? He said, no, your son will do it. But can I have the honor of collecting whatever which is required? He was so pleased and grateful to God. And the same thing that we should understand this morning that everything God has given us, first of all, we belong to God. The time we have is God is. Whatever we get is God is. So whatever we bring to God is God is. So how faithful are we that when we bring it, we are full of praise that we have brought something which God gave us, which is his, but we have accepted it as a sacrifice. Thank you. Now, let's ask ourselves this question on Tuesday. Which is the greatest gift that God has given to humanity? God has given us very many gifts. God has given us very many talents. Which is the greatest gift that God has given us? Jesus Christ. The greatest gift humanity has been given is the gift of salvation. Through who? Jesus Christ. That is the fundamental gift that we should know about. It is a gift that is recorded in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he did what? He gave. His only begotten son. That is the greatest gift that heaven has given to earth. That's why even the Gospels we are told, give cheerfully. Because you are basically returning to the owner. And the owner has not come to say, give me everything. For example, he has said for tight, give me 10 percent, percent, a tenth. So that is what the writer is talking about. That all the resources are not there for our selfishness. You know, somebody says, God has made sure there is enough resources for everybody's use. The problem is, some people end up amassing more than they need. They need. You know greed. What is greed? Amassing more than you need. You need. For example, you have too much, but your neighbor is sleeping hungry. We say in the U.S., 40% of the food ends where? In the trash. Do you know that? 40% of the food we eat here ends in the trash. We eat almost about a, a slightly above a half, the rest we throw in the trash. Do you know that 
what goes to the trash is enough to feed starving people elsewhere. It means some have amassed, but God made sure that there is enough. You know that somewhere in the New Testament, God has, have you ever heard that the birds of the sky have slept hungry? Have they slept hungry? The lions have stayed in the, in the jungle with the zebras. Have the lions ever ate all of the zebras? Why? God has given enough to make sure there is an ecosystem which is balanced. The problem comes when we try to amass resources are available for God's family. The problem comes when some members of God's family forget that these are resources for the whole family and start amassing them, grabbing and keeping for selfish interest. But the point is, at a spiritual level, you know, sometimes we say, my Christ. Do you know Christ is not, not yours alone? That is why you are told, when you are saved, you receive Christ. But Christ is not yours alone. You are also supposed to do what? To share. That's why it's called the good news. The good news. If you have received Christ, the good news, Christ, you have been saved. You don't keep Christ to yourself. Christ is a gift of heaven to you. When you receive that gift, what do you do? Share the gift to others. So we are called missionaries. It is our responsibility to take the good news to others. Just imagine when the Adventist movement began with Ellen G. White, Miller, and the others. If they had said we have found Christ and Christ is ours, could have the Adventism spread all over the world? They knew that the good news they had received was meant not for themselves alone, but to the rest of the world. The rest of the world. That is how the gospel spread. When it started with the disciples, it moved from Jerusalem. It went to Samaria. It went to Judea. And it went to the rest of the world. The world. That is how we need to share the gift of heaven. The gift of heaven is Jesus Christ. Any comments on the resources available for family? Yes, I know. Thank you so much. When I was going through the lesson, there's something which, because we have said Christ is the gift of which God has given us. This gift, I was, the lesson was telling us some things here. I know for the last one week, I've done what I've done as a human being. I've gone astray. No poverty is perfect here. Then I was looking at the lesson, how it was telling me as Christ as a, as a gift from heaven. I was seeing the forgiveness which I get from Christ because he came and died for me. That's why I know when I go, I pray, I know that somebody is Christ who is petitioning for me <coughs> for my forgiveness as a gift. Another thing I saw in Christ, this one, that grace of daily living. Sometimes when I'm down, I know there's Christ. I pray through him. That one keeps me going. That's a gift to me. Another thing I saw was his spiritual growth. Through Christ, through the word, I am able to do grow spiritually. Whatever is happening in me, I know there is a God somewhere. Through his son, I'm able to do what? To know what I'm supposed to know. Another thing which I saw in this, script, uh, this gift through Christ is hope of eternal life. Sometimes you are down. Through that hope of Christ, which he tells us, and he came and died for us, I know tomorrow is coming. And that's why I'm here in the church, because I know there is hope in this gift. I saw those three things, or four things, which was really touched me and helped me to do this lesson. Thank you. Thank you. Responsibility of God's family members. Somebody read for us Deuteronomy 6, 5. What is our responsibility? We have said we are stewards. We have said we are managers. What responsibility 
does the Bible give us? Deuteronomy 5, 6, verse 5. It reads, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Okay. That is our responsibility. To love the Lord your God with all your what? Number one. With all your what? Number two. You should be able to see those words there. Yes, and your soul and what? It means that is our responsibility. Our responsibility is to respond. God loves us before we loved him. When we receive the gift of heaven and they see that for God so loved the world that he said his only begotten son, what should be our response? We should love him back, back. And not partly. And not some time. But we should love God completely and totally. He says, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And how do you show it now? How do you show that love? Find it in 1 John 5, 3. I want us to read that. How do you show love to God? How do you reciprocate heaven that came to love you? What does 1 John 5, 3 say? It says this way, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we do what? We keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. You see? His commandments are not what? Burdensome. You know, when God, Moses gave, God gave the Ten Commandments, uh, Moses and the other leaders came and added others there. They became almost 600 and something. People said, there are too many. There are too many. They are becoming a burden. When Jesus came, he said, even the Ten Commandments are the basic. I can summarize them into two. Because the Jews were saying these commandments are about about them. Then Jesus said, these commandments are simple. Love the Lord your God with all and number two, love thy neighbor as thyself. So that is how we are expected to respond. We have been given a responsibility of obedience. Ours is to respond in obedience. So as stewards, if God has said, I have given you this property to manage, this property to use. Now, when he says, give a tenth, what are you supposed to do? How are you supposed to respond? To obey. Because he has said, that is the responsibility of humanity, to obey. We love God via obedience. So if he says, give tight, you obey. Give for the needy, you obey. That is what we are expected to do. Lastly, we have bank accounts. Eh? We have said the shilling is going down. Let's invest in shares. Let's invest in bank accounts. Let's buy property. Let... Where are we supposed to put our treasures? That's the question I'm asking. Where do we put our treasures? We are on Thursday. This is what it says in Matthew 6, 19 to 21. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But lay up yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart be also. Isn't it? Because the Bible told us, love the Lord your God with all your what? Your heart. Sa'it Nabiwa, where your treasure is, that is where your heart is. Is. We are cornered. You know, like, he has said, love the Lord your God with all your heart. And then, where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. 
So if your treasure is not in heaven, can your heart be in heaven? If your treasure is in worldly things, that is where your heart is, is. As the Bible says, not here. By the way, the Bible has never said that Christians should be poor. Has the Bible ever said that we should not be rich? The Bible has never said. In fact, the elder said that if you look at the Bible, some of the best servants of God, were they poor? Was Abraham poor? Was Job poor? Was Solomon poor? Solomon asked. He asked, in fact, one of the things you have to remember, Solomon was not a perfect man. He committed a lot of sins. But before he became king, he prayed. He didn't pray for riches. He said, God, first of all, give me what? Wisdom and knowledge. Did God give him only wisdom and knowledge? That's why New Testament says, Seek ye first the kingdom of, and all of this will be what? Any comments as we conclude the lesson? I'm going to comment here, and then I'll just give you one minute. You know, this thing, uh, issue of use, as you said, there's nothing wrong with uh, a Christian having wealth in this world. Sometimes we look at people who are rich, we think as Christians, no, it's not. I was looking on this world, or this world. why there is a warning that we as Christians, how should we look at the wealth we have here? There is one, some things we came in my mind. One is this one. All we acquire in this world is not guaranteed to last. That's what I saw. That's why he told me. Uh, find treasures. The other thing, we do not even enjoy on what we acquire. Tell me sometimes when you have a, you have a good car there, you only worry about people coming in your car, mess with it, you cannot get the people to use the car. That's another thing I saw. How we acquire them is always with dishonest. Tell me how many have got those wealth in an honest way. Many of them, it's not an honest way. Another thing, this world of the heart, we fight over inheritance. When Ona dies, what happens to the sons, kids who are there? They fight it for it. The company goes down. Another thing, seeing those earthly wealth, you are nobody in the social society. I've seen people who are rich back away in <coughs> Kenya. But now when we say because they are poor, they say there's nothing. So this wealth of that, what is it helping us? Thank you. It says, it says vanity of vanities. Yes, Dan. Yeah, mine is to say this. Uh, the lesson was telling us that we as all cre uh, creatures, we belong to our God. You know, the question is, when we are asked to give to God, does it mean God doesn't have he needs from us? The lesson was telling us God is the owner of everything. We are custodians. So the only thing he wants us to see, he wants to see that do, are we hoarding these things to ourselves? Are we being greedy? He wants to see that are we able to become hospitable of what he has given us? Thing I found in our lesson is that we have the inability to give God unless God himself has put into our hearts the spirit of giving. And how does he do it? He does it when we accept him as our savior and when we accept to follow the instructions he has given us. One of the things as Elder was saying, wealth is good when is being accountable to God. But you find much of the time what we have, we keep, keep, keep fearing what will happen for us in the future. We don't keep so that we can be doing God's work. We keep fearing maybe tomorrow if the market crumbles, I will have something for myself. Maybe if I will not have a job tomorrow, I will have some money. That's why we keep. So you always keep, keep, keep remembering what will happen for you in the future is not about what will happen to you when God comes. So God is calling us when we are keeping whatever we are keeping. It will not have value to us if we are not keeping it for God's glory. That's why when Christ was in this world, he never kept anything for himself. He was moving from place to place. Even the time when uh, the disciples were telling him, send away these people. Whatever we, we have here is not enough to give them. What did he tell them? 
Make them sit down. Why are you sending them away? Bring those pieces of bread and fish. He prayed and they were multiplied and they shared. So God is telling us that we should not keep. We should not invest so much in this world. We should invest in the kingdom of God. Thank you. Thank you. So this quarter, as we think about stewardship, let's not think, you know, sometimes when you hear stewardship, you think to money. When you hear the leader, leader for stewardship is standing there, you start thinking he's asking for some money somewhere. God has said, let's be stewardship of God's creation. Let's be stewards of our families. Let's be stewards of time. And God has said, the best gift heaven gave us is Jesus. For God so loved the world. That he gave what? His only begotten son. And we have been told, how can we show a response that heaven loved us? We can respond to that love by obeying the Father. That in stewardship, we talk about the owner who is the Father. And the owner who is the Father, he has given stewardship to the children. Because all of us, how do we call ourselves? Children of God? We have been given stewardship. And we have also, lastly, we are told that all of the resources God has given us are meant to be used for the family. May God bless you.